we doing here? We're in a hurricane! Wanna try? Fun! I know! I don't like hurricanes! You don't like hurricanes, Argo. I'll tell you a secret. Not many people do like hurricanes, which is why we use artificial intelligence to... Oh, oops. <sighs> Uh, which is why we use artificial intelligence to predict where hurricanes will strike so that people and robots can get out of the way to safety. I want a remote control like yours. But how does artificial intelligence do that? Good question. For a computer to make a prediction where a hurricane will strike, it needs information like satellite photographs, radar, wind speeds, moisture and pressure levels, and historical records. Then the computer takes all the information, processes it, and creates a prediction for where the hurricane might go. Ooh. <laughs> and that is more or less how artificial intelligence works. So basically, artificial intelligence works like this. A machine, like a computer, or a robot, takes in lots of information and uses that information to do something useful, like predicting where a hurricane will go, or cleaning a room, or driving a car, or even playing chess. But if the information the computer has is all information about me, information like your photos and videos and posts and likes and internet searches, then it can recommend songs you like based on what music you listen to, or it can predict what your favorite color is based on the color of your shirts you wear and photos you post, or it can show an ad for a new pair of shoes based on what kinds of shoes you search for on the internet. You know, that is actually pretty cool. Artificial intelligence is amazing. And sometimes a bit disconcerting if you give it too much information. Like anything else, there's always a good and a bad side to technology. Placed in the wrong hands, the result can be disastrous. So, I'm not going to become Terminator? <laughs> no, there's no danger of that. But be careful, Marie. He may be able to beat you at chess. Ha, huh, we'll see about that. Good day, gentlemen. Hi, Bob. Say hello to Vint Cerf, founder of the internet. Hello. Hello. Vint, my friends here, Marie and Argo, would like to know how the internet works. Well, it all started a long time ago. No, not that far back. Keep going. Almost. There. <laughs> In the 1960s, there were computers just like there are today. Except computers didn't know how to share data with other computers. So J.C.R. Licklider and Robert Taylor connected them. Paul Barron said, let's make packets for the data to travel in. Now, if I may, Vince, a packet contains a header and the data. The data is the information that's being transmitted. The header contains information about where the packet needs to go, how long it should take before it gets there, and what type of data is being delivered. That sounds just like my LAN. I invented the World Wide Web. As you may know, then, you can connect different devices to a LAN. For example, a file server. The other computers can access the files stored on the file server. There's also something called a web server that stores web pages, as in World Wide Web. If you connect a printer to the LAN, every computer can print to it. That's what I'm trying to do. World Wide Web? Now, if you take this LAN and connect it to another LAN and another, 
and another, and then connect this group of lands to other groups of lands, you have a wide area network, or WAN. And when you connect WANs to other WANs to other WANs, you get the internet, which is useless without the World Wide Web. Mr. Sir, sir, you are highly intelligent. Oh, thank you. Mr. Surf, what kind of data is inside these packets? Pictures, videos, music, text messages, web pages, anything you send or receive. How do they know where to go? They use addresses. Like a house address? Yes, except on the internet it's called an internet or IP address. When your computer sends a packet, it puts the IP address of the destination into the packet header so that the packet knows where to deliver the data. World Wide Web. And once the packet leaves the computer, routers help it arrive safely at its destination. The end. Tim, did you want to uh, cover the World Wide Web? <laughs> well, World Wide Web. maybe next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, Mr. Surf. H? Hello. Hello, world? Oh. Hello everyone, I'm Dennis. Hello. Hello. Dennis Rich here, creator of the C programming language. You created a programming language? How else would I spend my time? Nothing in the world is as fun as computer programming. How does it work? How does computer programming work? Hmm, how can I make this easy? Okay, most technology today is controlled by computers, correct? We know that. But that's about all we know. To control all these different types of things, computers use different types of software. Software? You mean like programs or apps or games you install? Yes, and software is simply a set of instructions that tells your computer or other device what to do based on the input it receives. Input? Let's take a video game. In a video game, what do you think the user input is? Um, pressing a button? Yes! So, when you press a button on a video game controller, you are giving the device instructions. Pressing a button triggers an event like swinging, jumping, or ducking, or... Or hitting an alien with a broom! That's right! And computer programming is simply writing that set of software instructions that tells the computer what to do. I get it! That sounds really fun. What's supposed to happen now? Hello. Eh? Welcome to the land of robots. My name is George Duvall. Hello, George. George Duvall is the inventor of the first industrial robot, Unimate. Hi, George. I'm Marie. I'm Argo. Wonderful. Argo, I love robots, and you are a fine robot indeed. Can you teach us about battle robots? I'll let you in on a little secret about battle robots. They're just the same inside as any other robot. Even a robot like me? Even a robot like you, Argo. The size and shape may be different, but you and Mr. Roboto are more alike than you are different. Really? Well, let me show you. Wow! All right, Argo, let's break you down. Just like Mr. Roboto, you have four primary components. <laughs> hands, arms, legs, and feet. <laughs> Not all robots have hands, arms, legs, and feet. 
But what they all do have are mechanical parts that help a robot move. Things like motors, gears, cables, and wires. Now, the second important component of any robot is sensors. What's a sensor? A sensor is exactly what it sounds like. It senses things. On a robot, the most common types of sensors are radar, pressure pads, and cameras. All these sensors give robots information about their surroundings so that they can interact with what's going on around them. Does Mr. Roboto use sensors? He sure does. When he flies, his camera and radar help him see where he's going so he can follow the bad guys and avoid crashing into things. Like canyon walls. Or innocent bystanders. Or vehicles carrying small children. <laughs> well, the third main component of any robot is the power supply. Ooh. The power supply is usually a battery. Without a power supply, a robot has no energy to move. That's why it's always important to keep my batteries charged. The fourth and final component of a robot is the controller. The controller is just like a human brain. It controls everything the robot does. Then I suppose we're done. Thank you! To watch more, subscribe to our YouTube channel.